that success breeds success and you'll find that your communities want to continue to see this move forward so even through the life of your grant um, you're able to find um, support networks but if you're not seeking out that sustainability and you're not seeking out those supports then it's going to be really difficult if we're waiting to the end so that's why we say we we bring this up a lot and we say that you know you really have to think about this from the very beginning and through throughout the entire process Chad's going to now share with you um, a video, and we're really hoping that it works. We did a whole bunch of testing through it, and if you got on early, you probably heard it. There is an often quoted parable that tells of a man and a woman fishing downstream. Suddenly, a person comes down the river struggling for life. The fisher pull, pull her out. Then, another comes and, again, must be rescued. This happens all afternoon and the fisher folk are getting very tired from constantly pulling people from the river. Eventually, they think, we need to go upstream and find out why so many people are falling in the river. When they go upstream, they find that people are drawn to the edge to look at the river, but there is no safe way to do this. Many of them fall. The fisher folk go to the community leaders and report the number of people who have fallen into the river. They also report that this is due to the lack of a protective barrier on the cliff. Community leaders build a wall behind which people may safely view the water. Some still fall, but there are fewer victims to rescue. This is the moving upstream analogy for prevention. Instead of expending all resources and energy on rescuing people, why not stop the problem from happening? When thinking about that parable and thinking about prevention specifically, one of the things that you're going to recognize is when you're addressing, when you're looking at the community and what is going on within the community, thinking about the environmental strategies and thinking about how if you see where we could address versus just a program and an impact prevention and impact the environment before the problem occurs, there's a greater likely you're going to have across the board impact. As it was noted in the video, it also says you may, it may not impact everyone, but it does impact greater numbers than just singular programs. So when we think about environmental strategies, strategies are, environmental strategies are that that address policies, norms, expectations, regulations, and enforcement within a shared environment with others in the community. Another way to look at that is these are policies and practices, kind of customs, habits, what's going on within your community, the kind of the community norms that change the context and norms where we live and work. It limits the access to substances and can prevent harmful behaviors. When we again look at environmental prevention, the decision to use alcohol and not to use the substance, it kind of it's impacted by three factors. First, the individual. What, what do they believe? What do they think? Do they think it's not that big of a deal, that it won't have an impact on them? Um, were they perhaps taught at an early age or, or see at an early age that uh, really drinking or using other drugs is not that big of a deal and it, it's not going to hurt them in the long run? Uh, thinking about the environment. What's the, where does the substance use occur? Does, is there areas in the environment, in the community, in the area that persons live that um, with a blind eye is turned towards? Uh, is alcohol advertised? Um, I've walked down many, uh, many uh, streets and small towns and big towns where there's a lot of advertisement that really promotes the use of alcohol and, and really shows it in a very positive way, passively and, um, and, and, and much more you know, in a way that you don't even recognize that it is um, having that impact. Also, how accessible is alcohol or other substances? Are they able to are they able to get it themselves or do they have contacts of persons that they're able to receive? And then the, the specifics of that of the substance itself. So the agent, how much does it cost? I always think that is uh, sometimes you can get a beer cheaper than you can get a bottle of water. 
And so when you think of the, um, the cost, um, and we think of young people specifically, it's noted that they have the most disposable income of any age in, in, along the, the realm. And so if it's inexpensive and they have the funds to spend it on that said product, they're probably going to use it. Again, when we look at the public health triangle model, and you look specifically on um, where the individual prevention will focus on, it focuses on the individual. It focuses on helping them make some changes in their decisions, helping them um, impact some thought processes. Where environmental prevention focuses on changing the agent and the environment. Individual prevention is usually in the form of educational programs, to change the perception of risk and harm. And so when we think about that, increasing awareness of consequences and the health risk with the idea of changing an individual's mind about their choice to consume their product, it, it, it can have a big impact on the individual. Yet yeah, education really isn't enough. You really need to be expanding upon that. And in addition, you need to be expanding upon the impact within the environment. When we look at environmental prevention, it works to change those messages, those messages that we see on a daily basis, those messages that we hear at home, that we hear um, at schools, that we hear at church, we hear at work, we hear um, from the television, we hear on the radio, we hear on YouTube, we hear everywhere that uh, it is setting kind of the stage that alcohol and tobacco and other drug use is really not that big a deal. It's kind of appealing. It's kind of uh, the thought of it's, it's, it's how you look more grown up. It's how, um, it's how you deal with stress. It's how you deal with celebration. It's, 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 it's the thing to do. Environmental prevention strategies focus on those norms, changing those norms, the media messages, laws and policies and how they're enforced and then accessibility and availability. When we look at that specifically as far as the multiple environments that are impacted and you look at how, um, how initially you looked at first that it, the individual programs would impact individual. Then you look at where we see that on an impact where you will have a a direct environment that has an impact on all of those being the individual peer, the family, the community, and also the school. It was earlier, it was asked, did, did, had, it in, had you intended to have um, the individual being, an individual peer being the center of the, uh, kind of like, I want to say a target, but um, being in the center of it all. And no, it wasn't the intention, but that's how, the, how, the, how this kind of pulled out. And so when we look at that and being that in direct environment, and then it does have the impact. When we look at community norms, what is considered an expected typical behavior in families, neighborhoods, schools, and communities? Um, has anybody ever heard the saying, kids will be kids? And um, well, I did it as a kid and I turned out okay. Um, maybe you might see at um, community functions, uh, celebrations as far as uh, weddings, um, where it is, well, it's no big deal and everybody's here and it's kind of the thing is at a certain time where all the kids then show up and drinking is, uh, it's allowed to happen. And those community norms have uh, been in, been around for a long time. And so considering that how we can, how you can change those. When you're looking at the media, it's very central to shaping attitudes and norms. And sometimes it, do, it happens in a way that we don't even recognize it. Um, you might also notice that, um, and we know what media is, but specifically you may not consider uh, product placement and where things are located and social media and the impact that, that it also has. Um, I, I found it um, interesting that song lyrics and just how different they are now and when I was growing up, which was a long time ago, um, that there was a, a lot of push to keeping those song lyrics, especially aimed at young people, not to be 
so positive towards drug use and um, misbehaving. Uh, it doesn't seem like song lyrics for this generation that that is, that is what is, um, that's not the push any longer. So really that it, what media is attempt, what, what you find from the media is it's attempt to shape the way the social issues are discussed. And so what we're really hoping is through environmental strategies is that you're shifting that. And there's the discussion as far as the impact that the media has. When we do the consideration of the four P's of alcohol marketing, you think of this as kind of um, media marketing 101. First, the product itself. Um, the price, is it affordable? The placement, uh, there's a lot of research that indicates that if it's at eye level or um, aren't you're able to reach it, it a really easily, that um, that is the product that gets purchased the most. And then the promotion, we seem to find that there's a lot of um, alcoholic products that have a huge push towards um, aiming their focus on young people and aiming their focus on that of um, making it seem like it's, it's what you do. This is what you use to be cool. And this is this is the substance that that young people drink. And lots of times you'll find that, for example, the Mike's Hard Lemonade, um, it, it, it doesn't really taste very alcoholic. It doesn't you can't taste the alcohol. It tastes like lemonade um, and so that it it's kind of a soft approach for kids to be exposed to the substance and um, then find that it's really not not you know it's, it's not that big a deal it doesn't taste that bad and then it builds their tolerance so how does the industry work when you're thinking about um, the the four P's. It's really important to understand those critical viewing skills and understand that media uh, will and, and does have an impact on your decisions. But you can have a media awareness that can help you in and can help young people in making different decisions. So keeping in the four P's and how the media works is that they are how advertisers work is keeping those that do drink, get them to drink more. Get those that aren't drinking to start drinking. Get the drinkers that are not drinking their brand to drink their brand. And you've really got to create a good public image. So you might notice that there are some um, alcohol prevention programs that are sponsored um, by alcohol um, in the alcohol industry just being really cautious of um, the messages and if there are some things that perhaps um, make them look good when they're really not doing good so it being really important and to uh, I, I did a program with some young people not too very long ago and, and just shared with them um, the different video, the different pictures and how that had an impact on their decisions. And it was really interesting for the young people to recognize that how much they were being influenced, um, kind of unknowing to them. They didn't really realize that they were being manipulated and just encourage them very much to use your critical viewing skills, you, you know, be aware and then make good decisions or make decisions from that. And hopefully they will be good decisions. <laughs> Excuse me. When considering law, laws and rules and policies, the determine and enforcement of families by law enforcement, schools, businesses, and city council. This is not just law enforcement. Law, and it's not always just laws. <laughs> Excuse me. When and where alcohol can be sold. Are there conditional permit, um, permits, meaning that during special occasions, during special times of the year, where typically alcohol is it, um, public intox or public consumption is not allowed but during certain times of the year, there is um, an opportunity for you to receive a conditional permit, and so that those um, those are made available. 
and then where the alcohol is being consumed. Is it in a very public place? Is it in a park, in an area where traditionally families are utilizing the access? And so being really considerate of those laws and norms and policies. When you think about policy change, there's the local policy change, and it takes both public and institution, institutional to reduce youth access to alcohol. So what that means is there's different types of local policies. There's the public, meaning the municipal and county. And so that those laws um, specifically could be a municipal. But then there's the institutional. Those are the families. What are the families? Um, uh, expectations and norms as far as they as far as consumption the school are there special policies specific to alcohol consumption across the board not just for athletes but there are there special um, are there special um, things that look at what that is accepted and not accepted I worked um, very closely with a school not too very long ago that enacted a policy that not only was there a consequence, but there was also assistance so that it set a clear policy that they weren't out to punish, that they were out to help. And it really showed that they were supporting not only families, but they were supporting the kids and that they were wanting to be very supportive of the community as a whole. Thinking institutional again, there's the colleges and then police. When you think about the importance, you must really focus on the commercial and social access to alcohol by youth. And so how accessible and how can they get a hold of it and what are the attitudes surrounding as far as that of alcohol and their use? Institutional policies are specifically enacted by an established group. So like I said before, they're established by schools, colleges, businesses, um, and that's an interesting thing to consider too. And when you think about businesses, what their expectations are in workplaces and even families, um, uh, not legally binding in those and in those areas, except for um, they can have some consequences larger. I mean, you could lose your job. You could lose the um, opportunity to go to school. You could lose your, your college. Um, you could lose perhaps um, attendance at the school. But they really and they impact a person's participation in that group and they can impact the person's decision to participate in negative um, or harmful behaviors. When we think about parents, you know, uh, parents obviously have a huge impact on young people. And one of the things is that I always encourage per persons to remember is that Parents really are the key and um, being an ally and recognizing that they have support. Sometimes parents feel like they maybe are the only ones in the whole world that are the meanest mom in the world or the meanest dad in the whole world. But parents really um, are great partners and they can have a huge impact on um, young people and their decisions to drink or not to drink. What they can do and one thing that you could, they can start and you can offer is they can monitor alcohol supplies in their home. Is it accessible? Um, in the area that I live, it is very common to have a garage fridge. It is a, the thing. And the garage fridge usually has um, quite a bit of, of alcohol. And it might not be in um, like the, the container that it came with. They may take the beer out of the, the 12 pack and just stick it in there. And then don't monitor if they aren't monitoring if there's bottles missing. Um, you can talk to other parents as far as what your expectations are and, and what they're, you know, if, if, if I send my kid to your house, um, can I expect that they're going to be a, in a safe environment? Never purchase alcohol for your, your teens or underage friends. Um, they think, well, I'd rather them, I'd rather buy it for them and they not get in trouble, but um, two negatives don't make a right. So when we look at that, um, just again, avoiding providing with your teen and um, making it seem that it's uh, not to be their friend. Um, you know, it, there's a very difference between a, a parent and a friend. And so those are some, some suggestions and some things that you can offer to uh, parents. Okay. When we look at the um, law enforcement, what can law enforcement do? When I say compliance checks, uh, what that is, is essentially, I know that you all know, but I'm just going to say just for my own good, 
Compliance checks is essentially uh, going in um, to establishments that sell alcoholic products or tobacco products and um, just verifying that they're doing, um, they're, they're selling alcohol in, in the right way, that they have things placed in the area that they're supposed to. It's kind of a, the old adage, inspect what you expect. If you expect them to follow the law, then you need to inspect it. I say that too with, with my kids all the time, that yeah, I'm going to give you a rule, but I'm going to also inspect it that you're doing it as, as, as intended. The other thing law enforcement can do is monitor community events, work as partners with those community events, and assist those community event organizers in uh, making sure that it's a really safe and healthy environment. And, um, you know, that presence really assists with that. Enforce laws that, um, that don't turn the blind, blind eye to um, when there are adults that are providing alcohol and hosting um, teenage parties. Um, sometimes I've worked with a community that that was kind of the policy, their unspoken um, policy, that they, they knew that there was a party always at this house and um, lots of times the parents would take the keys and sometimes the kids would stay there and law enforcement would just drive by and th thought that they'd rather them be there than out in the country. But what happened is that they we they lost um, some teens into a drinking and driving crash and um, that attitude changed, but it was too, too little too late. Another thing, uh, law enforcement work to implement improved laws that affect youth access. Um, they're in the midst. They they know what works. They know um, what they see, and so really uh, working to think about how you can make the law even um, you know even sharper, even better. And so law enforcement play um, a big role too. What schools can do, you know, when you you'll notice that this looks really familiar as far as um, the, the the individuals that I'm bringing up. Those are the partners that we're we're always encouraging you to have on your coalition. And um, when you think about uh, when you're asking coalition members um, for little things that they can do and big things that they can do, and lots of times people like to have, well, well what can I do? What can I do to be to, to make an, and have an impact. Um, you'll notice that we're kind of breaking it down in, in that aspect. But what schools can do, uh, prohibit possession or use at all school activities, um, even, um, you know, those things that are off school grounds but are school, still a school activity. Adopt those practices that prevent students from bringing substance to school events and um, enforcing those and making sure that it, it does, doesn't happen. Um, and then education, education of parents about access to substance, um, uh, educating them as far as the latest, as far as what's going on. A new practice that has been happening in a lot of areas, area schools, is before young people can get into like a school dance, they will um, be breath, they will have the breath um, oh my gosh, the uh, passive breath test and um, to determine if they're under the influence. And if they are under the influence, then their parents are called to come pick them up. So there's a lot of really great policies that can support that. And again, it goes back to, you know, if kids expect that um, there's going to be a safe environment, we need to make sure that we're going to provide that. So looking at public and what the public can do. And with those public policies, those are enacted by the federal, state, or local governments. These are legally binding. These are items that the government um, has put into effect and um, should be followed across, uh, across the board. So what I mean by that is that these are laws and policies that are on the books, but how they're enforced can be determined within the local community. So we're really encouraging you to be enforced. So thinking about those, the minimum age to buy. The minimum age for alcohol, 21. Um, the minimum age for tobacco is 18. But I do know that there's quite a few um, communities that are looking at and, and, and looking to see if we can get that raised. 
Uh, social hosting, there's the Paul's Law as far as there's a pretty big huge penalty, there's a huge penalty um, that if you are caught social hosting and um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big fine and there can even be jail time. The taxes, um, we have taxes that, that can impact and, and, and there's higher taxes on alcohol products and tobacco products. The underage drinking laws, you know, if you are um, under the age of 21 and you have a BAC of 0.02 and a, um, you can get, and you're driving, you can get a DUI. Uh, driving while intoxicated, the DUI laws. Uh, restriction on advertising and billboard pla and placements. There, there are restrictions, and so those are things that you don't have to um, seek to create, but you maybe seek to make sure that they are following those laws. Restriction on smoking in public places and private entities. I know we have some coalition members even on the line that um, did a lot of work with that and had some really great success. And, and I know that, for example, Reno County had a really big impact on our state fair, and so kudos to them. Open container laws, obviously. Open container, you can't have anything opened within your car. Um, and and um, those laws just ensure that you can say, well, I wasn't drinking it, but it's open, so the law has been broken. Again, limits on the location and densities of liquor stores and then their hours of operation. Um, this one is either you can't have a liquor store so close to, um, to a school. And... Um, really try to consider that as far as like also the walking paths. Rules governing the use of placement of cigarette vending machines and, and right now vending machines are not allowed and they are gone but those are some policies that had been enacted to increase um, some public health and um, in reducing the access to alcohol and tobacco um, by minors but those are some things that you know you don't you don't see vending machines anymore and those were a way that young lots of times young people were getting a hold of it so it was it's a environmental strategy strategy that had a really huge impact and you don't have to go back and try and do it again. When we look at social access, and I'm sorry, I had to take a breath there for a second. When we look at social access and policy examples, alcohol availability at community events. When we think about this, you think um, I'd like you to think about um, all the community events that you have in your, your local area. Think about that and I'd like you to picture where um, the consumption happens. Is there a beer garden? Is there an area that you could, that's the only place that you can drink it or is it allowed to, um, you can have in that, in that venue, you can have it anywhere. So taking that in consideration, think about controlling the availability and the use of alcohol, for example, like at parks and beaches and other public spaces, um, concerts, uh, street fairs, uh, sporting events. Um, look at the thing, the, the range, it can be anywhere from a total ban to where you have a restriction of where on Sundays that there's no alcohol. And the town that I live on, I live in, um, Sunday is family day and there's absolutely no alcohol can, um, sold that day and it's very much toted as a family day. Implement voluntary, voluntary by event organi organizers or through local um, legislators. So you may find that you can work with those event organizers, talk to them. Um, Rodeo days, uh, you know, typically lots of, um, they have a special day where perhaps that they don't sell alcohol that day at all. And again, it's toted as a, um, it's toted as a family event. This can be a local policy where you work with your event and really think about also the event facility. Um, there are um, some privately owned events uh, facilities that maybe you could uh, visit with and see if they could make it a, a uh, private business uh, policy. When you think again about this again uh, availability at those community events, um, if for example that you would like to see if there's just an area for families and young people, so that there would be a designated area where alcohol is not allowed in this, this specific 
this specific area. So this is these are options. These are different things to think that as far as the building and looking to change. And lots of times when you're changing norms and you're changing those policies, sometimes you have to take baby steps. Um, again, establishing a designated drinking area where underage youth are not allowed in there. And then and then they you, they can't leave it. So uh, we uh, during our fair, we have a beer garden, and you have to have an armband to get in, and then you can only get one beer per purchase, and you can't leave with it. Um, lim looking at limiting alcohol sponsorships, I know that lots of times you can get the banners super cheap, but they have to also have the the alcohol sponsors uh, logo on there but thinking about looking at ways that you can uh, look for other sponsors that don't promote that of alcohol having those alcohol free day nights or um, days or nights really important thing is really working with the event organizers to uh, think at procedures and thinking about enforcement of those policies and working with, not against, but the security. Um, how, how will you establish a procedure for handling an intoxicated person? Um, making sure that um, if they were allowed to drink in this facility, how can we get them home safely? How can we, um, uh, for a better way to say, it, cut them off? And so when we look at that, really having that procedure set up, not just trying to guess um, as, as it occurs. Alcohol availability, again, um, one of the things that when you look at is the, uh, something that could be really important in, in making sure that it works well is require alcohol licensors to, holders to have a liability insurance. Um, there is a uh, state law that has um, some legal requirements there on liability. It um, just is another safety net. Require responsible beverage service training for alcohol sellers and for event coordinators. This is a really great opportunity, not only for you um, as a coalition, but also as the event um, sponsor to learn a lot as far as how you can be responsible in serving alcohol, what to look for, um, things to be prepared for. And lots of times I find that after the um, event sponsors themselves after they have gone through the training they, they be, there's a lot of things that they learn and a lot of things that they are thankful for that they have gone through that training and um, they're super easy to sponsor and really um, a really great way to have a, a big impact on um, responsible drinking for those over the age of 21. Require the alcohol sellers to be at least 21 years of age um, require a manager to be on duty at the booth at all times so that there's the go-to person and that can make sure that those policies and procedures are followed through. Uh, through that uh, responsive beverage, beverage training, you, they will receive an age identification checking procedure and they will learn how to do that um, well and so uh, making sure that that is established. Uh, the one thing that's also key is prohibiting the persons that are serving from being able to drink. Um, you're maybe not as cognizant as far as um, some good decision making if you are drinking and selling the alcohol beverage. Making sure that you have some signs up that are talking about the how it's illegal to provide alcohol to minors and that it's also illegal for uh, to sell to intoxicated persons. This is a, a safety net not also not just for young people, but this is also a safety net for the the ab, the the establishment that's selling the, the alcohol and that they can point to that if this is a legal thing. This is something I could get in trouble and I could I could have a huge fine if I sell to you. So there's no way I'm going to sell to a minor. And then also there's no way I'm going to sell any more to an intoxicated person. So it's kind of it's a win win. When you look at the importance too of those community events and the security, um, having that, that, as I said earlier with law enforcement, having that partnership the, with them, they're not security, but they're added security, if that makes sense. Um, but estab establishing that procedure, how to handle the intoxicated drinker, uh, the security staff be adequate, adequately trained, 
and making sure that they're that they are aware of the environment and their surroundings and making sure that they're they, they are enforcing the laws and the policies that are have been established ban consumption in parking lots and monitor those parking lots because lots of times if you're drinking in the parking lot you're probably going to get in your car when you're thinking about how also to have a big impact, uh, limit the size of the cup to 12 ounces. You know, a 48 ounce big gulp is not a really good way to monitor and, and, and help a person responsibly drink. Use cups with alcohol beverages that are distinguishable so that there's not, they don't look exactly like a cup that you would get maybe in the midway that you might have pop in. Limit the number of servings a person can purchase. So, you know, they can't go up there and get an arm load. Stop serving alcohol at least an hour before the, the event closes, at least. And then make sure that there's, there's more than just alcohol at the event. Um, sell some food and non-alcoholic uh, drinks. And I've also noticed that there's been some um, there's been some push towards providing if you indicate that you are going to be a non-drinker that they'll provide free water social access um, some policy examples the social host liability have, i hope you've all have heard of those who host lose the most it's a campaign that really looks at uh, reinforcing the awareness that serving or providing alcohol to minors or persons who are intoxicated, that you could be held liable. And if that person who has been provided the, the substance is killed or injured um, or kills or injures another person, that you will be held liable and um, e there will be um, charges pressed against and it's a, it's a pretty big uh, fine. But there is a, a lot of um, resources with that, those who host lose the most, a lot of media uh, material, a lot of letters to the editor, and a lot of promotional materials that can really heighten the the awareness and really increase the education. And there's some really great resources from that. Um, we talked about parents earlier, and we talked about that of the social hosting. And when you think about this specifically, it's really important that when we're thinking about changing an environment, in an environment. It's taken a long time for that environment to get there. I always think of this as, um, you know, kind of like weight gain. <laughs> it took a long time to get um, to the, the weight that you're uncomfortable if, you're, if you are at a weight that you're uncomfortable. So it's going to take some time to get back to where you feel comfortable. And no one likes to be shamed and no one likes to be called names. And so blaming and shaming and naming is not the way we want to go. Um, that no parent and no community feels 100% competent and 100% of the time in, in environment prevention is about addressing the environment that the young people and their parents are experiencing. So thinking about um, wh where um, we can increase some of their education and increase some of their their thoughtfulness as far as how they can be more equipped to offer a safer environment and encourage some safer policies. They need support. Community needs support to create those home those home policies that can keep their children safe. And if social norms are saying that youth drinking is not that big of a deal, it's okay. It's you know it's bound to happen. It's a rite of passage. Um, the, and, and there's a lot of pressure, and then parents feel like they need to comply. So when you really think about that, um, building that support network for um, the parents to see that you know um, it's kind of the squeaky wheel, but that's not really what happens. Parents can be huge allies, and it's really important to get them on board, um, keeping the focus really on the larger social norms instead of those individual parents. And so um, really looking at how um, we can have a really big impact on parents is through support. I have spoke really quickly, and I always have a tendency to do that, but anyone who's ever been on a training with me, you know that. And it's because I get so excited about um, prevention and how it can have a really big impact. But my watch just told me that it is time to stand. And so that tells me that we need a quick break. So what I'd like everybody to do, all 33 of us, I would like for everybody to stand up from your computer, Take a, uh, a little bit of a stretch break, 
and I would like to offer a five minute break and I mean seriously just a five minute break so if you would like to grab um, refresh your coffee refresh your water whatever it is that you're drinking that's non-alcoholic and um, or if you need to run to the the restroom whatever you need to do we will get started back promptly at 1055 but I want to offer just a quick stand up and stretch break and then I'm going to also double check to make sure that in the chat log if there were any questions. So everyone take a quick stretch break. We'll start back at 1055. Chad, would you mind giving um, permissions to Mike? I'll do that right now. Thank you. Chad, are you there? I am. Did you see my public policy slide? Yep, that's up. Okay, great. Looks good. Okay, Chad, I shared my webcam, so you need to share yours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> as frightening as it is. <laughs> Can you see mine? Okay. Just stretching. Very impressive. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> I should have played some music during our stretch break. I didn't didn't think about it quickly enough. I thought it was super convenient that my watch went off right at the time that I was like, ooh, I'm a little past. I'm gonna need to, I probably should do this. So I was like, hey, there's my cue. Yeah, that's hey, perfect. Chad. Yeah. Hey, Chad, where's the refreshments? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was supposed to do that. So, no. Uh, so, I have, I have Hershey's Kisses Lava Cake. Um, catch. Okay. Oh, got it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Enjoy. We will. We have to Oh, good. <laughs> By my watch, it's 1055. 
So I hope yep. everybody is back. If um, Mike, if you're ready, I am very happy to um, close my webcam so that we can get started. I am ready. Oh, you're the best. Okay. Hi, can well, you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Hi, and you can see my public policy slide up there? I sure can. Looks uh, great. We're good to go. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is Mike uh, Parsons. Those of you expecting to uh, hear from Chrissy today, um, I'm sorry to maybe disappoint you. Um, Chrissy had to go down to Oklahoma, so I'm going to fill in and cover her slides for her this morning. Um, so I'm going to follow up with uh, some things that Heather had said. Um, one thing we're going to jump into is a different type of policy. Um, and she did touch on it, but it's the public policy. Um, and there's some different types of public policy. Um, one of them that we're looking at is the commercial access policies that address commercial sources of alcohol, um, such as the wholesalers, restaurants, hotels, promoters, retailers, things like that. If you take, I know that we can't really respond to this, um, but if you take a look at that picture below, um, would you interpret that this community is, is pro uh, commercial alcohol policies or maybe against uh, commercial alcohol, uh, alcohol policies? And I know you're all sitting there thinking uh, against, but uh, it's not correct. It, it, to me, it would be more for uh, a pro um, community or commercial access policies. One thing to kind of remember about the commercial policies and, and the public policy, I'm sorry, is that the local policy um, can be like Heather mentioned at a state level. So like driving um, it, you know, intoxicate or the, the serving alcohol at age 21. Um, the the, the um, under the influence driving at 0.08, but there can also be um, other ones that we talked about, which would be municipal or county type policies. Um, and all this, all the people must follow state laws or federal laws, but then each community can kind of um, set up their own different policies as they go through this. Um, and so you may see quite a bit of change among the communities, even in Kansas. And I'll kind of share about that here a little bit more as we go through that. Um, oops. There we go. Um, commercial access policies, uh, some examples of that. Um, one would be increasement of enforcement of sales through compliance checks. Um, this could be, as, as we mentioned, uh, police officers that go in and, and just check establishments um, and kind of see what's going on, um, maybe checking ideas of folks that are in this establishment. Um, if they're not allowed to be. But another example of public, uh, public policy can be some establishments will let folks into the establishment um, being under 21, but then either at a certain time they must leave or they can be in there, but they're not allowed to drink. So there's one way to do appliance checks that way. Another way they do appliance checks is they often will take people that look older than, than they are. Uh, maybe they're, they're not of the legal purchase age but they take them with them and they send them into places and they see if they will sell. So they will look through compliance checks, you know, um, in those ways also. So if they could increase those, um, that would, that would be one way of maybe cutting down on these areas that you may know of, or that you may have heard of that um, are serving alcohol or where the youth are getting access to it, things like that. Um, another one is reward and reminder program for merchants. Um, and can, this is also in conjunction with enforcement, but this one's a little bit different to where, the vendor uh, may get the, the reward um, for doing the right thing, um, which can be done in different ways. But uh, for example, if, if there happens to be law enforcement in a particular establishment and they do see that this establishment is checking IDs of these individuals, um, if they're following that uh, only 21 year olds are serving alcohol, that they possibly cut down alcohol sales on somebody that's publicly or obviously intoxicated, things like that, they can give them a reward um, or kind of reminder recognition that they were doing the right thing. Um, so that's where they, that's where they could go and, and kind of a, a, um, work down that road, not necessarily the negative of, you know, writing a citation or something like that, but using a positive reinforcement um, to also um, make sure that that's taken care of. Um, the other one is responsible beverage service training. Um, there's some on that that um, some, some places do re are required, other places don't require it. Um, I'm trying to think of one that we talked about the other day, is it Applebee's? Um, they have a commercial or they have a policy that um, all, everyone in their establishment, that they do go through responsible service, beverage service training. 
Um, not everyone does that. Not everyone's required to do that. Um, but those are things that you could possibly look into or try to control. Um, there may be some places or communities that don't allow certain establishments to open up in their area unless they go through this type of training. So um, the other thing is, is there could be benefits if, if people are hesitant to, to do this. There can be, be benefits through their insurance companies um, because any additional uh, responsible service or beverage service training um, could, you know, show their dedication to um, not serving, you know, minors or youth um, and following other alcohol laws in their community um, by committing, by uh, completing this training. So that's something that you may want to look into. Age identification policies and methods um, is pretty self-explanatory. I mean, it'd be, um, as I mentioned before, uh, carding people, um, whether they look 21 or not, um, the different ways that they um, control their alcohol consumption in their areas. Um, as Heather mentioned before, it could be at different events. It could be different sized cups. It could be alcohol-free zones. It could be um, uh, different areas that do serve. Um, it could be certain events that they don't even allow alcohol at. Um, another one would be established a minimum seller age, um, which a lot of places are 21, but some aren't. I don't know if you have places in your community that uh, like a grocery store or possibly a retail store like Quick Trip or Quick Shop, you go in, possibly purchase some alcohol and they're not allowed, that person is not allowed to sell it, um, would be kind of a, a positive um, that they do call someone over that's of the legal age to go ahead and sell that alcohol to that person. Um, another interesting one is to ban home delivery. And this is a really good example of what we call a, a community um, or it could be either local, it could be municipal, um, but ban home delivery, um, we've looked that up and, and there's different laws, there's different ordinances, even on that in Kansas. Um, like it used to be illegal in Kansas City, uh, Missouri, but then they passed something for the city ordinance only that did allow alcohol delivery, but then the alcohol delivery only could be certain ways. So there's a way to, if even if the home delivery was allowed, then you could possibly work together on a environmental policy on that it only can be done certain ways. Um, I do know uh, one thing that I saw recently on the news, and I'm not sure how they're going to do this. Well, I'll have to look more into this. And I know some others may also, but um, Pizza Hut announced in order to stay up to date and kind of in competition with the pizza business is that they're, I think right now they're delivering at 300 stores across the United States, but their goal by this summer is to be delivering uh, beer to, um, to, to homes or home delivery of alcohol in over 1,000 uh, different establishments across the United States. So um, that may be something to keep an eye on, um, especially if your community may seem to favor um, different commercial policies that do allow things like that. Um, this is a little bit more detail on compliance checks. Uh, they're a tool to identify establishments that sell alcohol to underage youth. Um, they can, by ordinance, outline the standards for conducting the checks and penalties for places. Servers and sellers who sell or serve alcohol to underage youth, we kind of talked about that. Um, there can be different ways to enforce that. This is a good example of um, also the positive reinforcement and also their um, institutional uh, policy where they may issue fines and things like that. But Local ordinance can set those fines. Um, they can set different things on, you know, first offense, second offense, third offense. They can set something by the amount that that's going to cost the individual for violating any of these compliance checks and things like that. Um, and then also the police can inst institutionalize these practices. Um, so um, not only can they do compliance checks on individuals or establishments, for example, um, but more on the individual side, there's uh, what we call the sobriety checks, which are compliance checks kind of after the fact. Um, I realize that, but that would just be another example of a compliance check, not necessarily on an establishment, but just something that's going on in that community. Um, examples of this, uh, we talked about this a little bit already, um, the responsible beverage service training, a little bit more information on it. Um, it's just a way that you can educate um, the owners and the different folks that work there. Um, in the establishment about um, the penalties um, of and uh, the, I guess, the fines, um, different things that could happen uh, to avoid illegal selling of alcohol to youth or intoxicated patrons. I did mention that a little bit earlier that um, there are a lot of uh, local ordinances that um, are in place that if people appear um, definitely intoxicated, that they quit serving that individual, but also 
Um, that's a tough one because it's it's more of an opinion um, than like fact-based relay. I mean, you know that you could almost ask 99 people if you would think that person was um, highly intoxicated and you would probably get yeses, but some people are a little bit hesitant, whether it's the the, part, the patron's behavior or something like that to enforce um, the, the fact of somebody being intoxicated and trying to cut them off. Um, so that would be um, something that would be covered in this uh, beverage service training that they talked about. It can be required. We talked about this by a local or state law. We kind of mentioned Applebee's um, that could do that. We've um, had other places that they can, uh, that I've been aware of, like in my town uh, where I grew up is that they could um, and this was back where everything was, my whole town was, it seemed like um, that picture that we looked at was, uh, you interpreted it as a pro-alcohol community, um, a small town I grew up on the river, but um, they did have some ordinances like as far as um, along the, the river, like when you go into the different uh, uh, marinas and things like that, there are only certain ones that could sell alcohol and other ones that couldn't. So um, that was all set up by the, the community and things like um, different laws and ordinances so that um, they could go through there. So having these businesses undergo training could be something that could be set by um, the local level and not necessarily, you know, at the federal level. Um, and like we mentioned, some insurance companies, they may require it, which if they do require it, they get discounts on their um, insurance uh, for their business and insurance over their employees. Um, availability. Um, this kind of talks about uh, public and commercial policy um, kind of actually hits on the, the four P's of marketing, which other talked about. Um, but if you look at that is uh, how easy to obtain the product. We go back to that picture at the beginning of my slides. Um, was it easy to obtain the product? Um, the answer would be yes. Um, there were several establishments. I think there was one, two, three, four, five establishments right on the same corner um, that were all selling either liquor or beer or something like that. Where is it sold? It was sold in like different types of establishments. There was a liquor store. Um, there was actually a bar, it looks like. Um, there was also a, what it said cold beer only, which sometimes they describe those as beer caves. Um, and then also it was um, promoted as wine and spirits, which would also be like a liquor store, um, but it was running a lot of specials and things like that. Um, who's making it available? Uh, all these places were making it available. Um, but one thing to realize in these communities too, is that it's how much they make it available. Um, for example, you know, you can buy in bulk. Um, they're running specials. It can be purchased 24 hours a day. Um, certain communities, like I know the town I grow, I grew up in, um, there was um, different areas that were not monitored at all. Growing up on the river, um, all the youth knew and a lot of adults that if we went out on the sandbars, on the river between the two states, there really wasn't any jurisdiction that would come out there that could really enforce any of the, the rules, or they may have been able to, but they didn't. Um, so that was one thing that we were all aware of and um, things that were allowed in our community. Um, the other thing is, is that who's making it available? Um, you can kind of look at um, what we call the promoters, as Heather mentioned, um, but it could be, quote, the corner bar is, is promoting um, you know, different types, types of activities to get folks in there, uh, running the specials, different things, so the alcohol becomes more available or easily available, um, which then can lead to other issues as far as alcohol itself. Um, how easy is it to get served in your community? Um, where are the access points? Um, I know here in Lawrence that there's several establishments that are known for, I'm not going to name them, but are known for selling to underage folks. Um, nobody understands really why or how they keep, you know, being able to get away with that. Um, but it would be something that would be interesting maybe for a, a you know, a group or community to look into or coalition um, to see kind of, you know, how, why that's, that's going on. Um, the other thing is, is that people know not necessarily where they can just go to partake in drinking alcohol, but they also know where they can purchase it. And they may also know the different locations on who will sell it to them and who won't. Maybe it's somebody's older brother, maybe it's somebody's you know, cousin, maybe it's a, a place uh, with an establishment with maybe some elderly folks that own it and they sell the alcohol you know, to the miners just due to them not being completely up to date on everything that's going on in their community. So availability um, or basically how easy or difficult it is to get alcohol is something that's very important to consider when you look into your, um, your environmental strategies. 
Um, once again, we're going to touch just briefly on the SPIF framework or the SPIF model. Uh, not only do you use this for your overall plans in your communities, but you can also use this when you're looking at environmental strategies. Um, as far as your assessment goes, you can look at the, the needs, resources, readiness of your group, um, the capacity, who do you have there um, to address these needs, um, develop um, with the planning, develop a plan on what you're, which one you're going to kind of address, um, and then implement your plan and then evaluate your plan. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I just wanted to touch on that and kind of where you would you know, use this in, in your plans as you work, work towards them. Um, another important thing is to make sure that your, um, your strategies align with your risk factors, um, that your substance related um, uh, situations uh, match up with your risk and protective factors, which then match up to your strategies, such as your policies, practices, and programs. Um, you wouldn't want to try to match up a, a public, uh, let's say, um, like a, a public uh, community uh, risk factor um, or environmental strategy with something that may fall under the social. You'd want to make sure that everything kind of matches, falls together, because um, mainly what you're doing is you're addressing the how of, of how are you going to do this, how are you going to address this environmental strategy. Here's an example. Um, this is kind of a sample process. You're looking at the percentage of, as far as the consumption pattern, um, you know, box A would be the number or percentage of college students that binge drink. Um, the risk factor would be students that don't think binge drinking is harmful. Um, also high access of campus on, uh, on campus and near campus. And then the conditions that allow this is campus allows, allows alcohol on their university, at their games, at different events. Um, local fraternities encourage the binge drinking at frat parties, um, other special events that may be held, and then university staff are not aware of the extent of the problem. Um, there can be alcohol that's allowed in dorms where other universities don't allow alcohol in the dorms, different things like that. Um, so this is just kind of a sample process of where you'd want to match up your, um, let me go back the slide, to match up your strategies with your risk factors. Um, the next thing is, uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, but briefly, we've looked at the what, um, and this is kind of a different example, is uh, in 2018, um, grade students in such and such county reported drinking alcohol in the past 30 days. Um, the why would be um, they reported that it was very easy to get some beer, wine, and hard liquor. Um, to what end? Uh, what is the goal? Um, the goal is to, I'm jumping over to the final, the last column, that um, the county X that reporting using alcohol in the past 30 days will decrease from 5% from the baseline of 30% to 25% in 2022. Now the question is, and this is where you would put this on your model, is how do you plan on doing that? So if you're looking at the, using your SPIF model to kind of achieve this, um, you would want to make sure that you're putting in or filling in the how as far as um, completing your plan on those uh, strategic model um, that way. Um, this is something we've kind of talked about. Um, one is uh, interpretations that I, Kind of went over with the picture um, of the com that fake community at the beginning of these slides, but um, do your homework. Um, working with communities, um, kind of make sure you know what's going on. You can do that through going around and going around and observing what's going on. Um, you may already have several people that know. Get the right people on your coalitions that have knowledge of the the local policies or the environmental strategies um, or different things, um, social policies in their community. Um, but you really need to do your homework in order to kind of see what you need to do to make a difference in what environmental strategy that you um, decide to address. Um, here's some easy ways to do that, uh, such as reading your state and local al alcohol policies, ordinances, learn about the enforcement, um, learn about the roles of your officers in your community, what they are allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do, possibly what amount of time they have to do this on. Um, also, maybe what their budget is to be able to do some of this, such as compliance issues, things like that. Um, learn the political process in your community. So if you wanted to change, um, you may you need to be aware of what may be um, the steps in getting that change. Because sometimes it's uh, nice to start the correct way at the beginning um, and kind of work your way through that in order to make changes in your community. Um, look at the policies um, and laws that already exist, because it may be as simple as that they're already there, but they're not being enforced. If they're not being enforced, then you would jump down to analyzing um, your, who in your community has the power to enforce those, um, or possibly if they aren't already in existence, they could change that policy or help you change that policy. 
Um, I understand the process of uh, obtaining a re an alcohol retail license. Um, that makes you better educated on these establishments um, that, that come into your community. Are they required to go through um, alcohol beverage training? Are they not? Um, are they required to have other, you know, rules or regulations set up um, within their establishment in order to open? Um, are they meeting all the, the requirements um, from the alcohol beverage control in order to be open? Um, and do they have plans in place that they can kind of, I don't want to say a guarantee, but ensure that um, youth won't be served or um, over intoxicated individuals. Um, and then also the process, we kind of talked about this, but the process for enforcement of the alcohol retail licenses in your community. Um, those can really help you maybe cut to the chase on some of these environmental strategies that you want to address. Um, determine what other local agencies are doing and address the problem. Um, there may be some people that are trying to address um, certain strategies already, but they may need your help. Maybe they don't have all the players in place. Um, so you may want to ask around and kind of check around with different groups or coalitions in your area if you have some and just kind of see what they may be working on. Um, what specific locations in the community might be considered high risk or problematic. Um, with this, it, it talks about lakes and rivers, homes with large land areas, homes with basements, youth with working parents, open fields, wooded areas, and barns. Um, if you look at that lakes and rivers, which I mentioned um, with, with my experiences growing up was um, a lot of growing up on the Mississippi River, a lot of us, uh, a lot of our, our friends and acquaintances had boats. Um, and like I said, there was areas out there that were never uh, patrolled. There was never enforcement out there. Um, so it was just kind of a free area for um, the youth to go to partake in, in alcohol consumption. Um, homes with large land areas, you need to be careful of this. If you're actually um, someone that has these areas, if somebody would conduct a uh, or have a party or an alcohol event on your, your land without you knowing it, um, the social hosting law um, still plays effect. Um, as it's not as intentional, it doesn't show intent, but you're still responsible because you're required to know what's going on um, in your property. So um, that's another thing. If you hear of, you know, parents, let's say you hear of a, a party going on every weekend in, in the same area, and then the parents are claiming they didn't know about it, they're, they still fall under the social hosting law. So that may be something that you want to look at. Same thing with homes with basements. Um, if, you know, youth got in there with alcohol, but each time you went down to check on them, um, the alcohol was easily hid um, or kept out of sight or you didn't, good, do, didn't do, do a good job checking on them, um, then you could still be uh, liable for that because it's happening in your home. Um, youth with working parents, um, this happens a lot. Um, it started, you know, back with I would kind of date myself with latchkey um, and Heather mentioned like having alcohol fridges, but um, just in normal refrigerators, uh, youth that come home, their parents are working. Um, whether there's a liquor cabinet, whether there's the beer fridge um, or whatever, you can make sure that um, you, you've got that under control um, and, and kind of let your youth know what your expectations and your rules are for that. Um, rural communities, open fields, wooded areas and barns. Um, uh, Deanne brought up a good example to me that I overlooked and I wasn't even thinking of, but not only do folks have uh, like beer fridges in their garages, but um, in smaller communities and such as in maybe rural communities that have barns and things like that, they may have refrigerators out in their barns that are even less protected. And if they keep large amounts of alcohol in those, those barns, um, youth know to go to those barns. They know which ones maybe are unlocked, unmonitored. They can go through there, grab a few, let's say, alcohol beverages from there, go to the next one. And before you know it, they've got enough to, um, you know, because not that even one couldn't cause problems, but they could definitely... Um, come across a large amount of alcohol that way as they go through it. Um, the last one, um, before we jump over to community edu uh, communication education, is um, when you get started is collaboration. I mentioned this a little bit, a bit ago, but allow partners with different perspectives to work together. So if you could get um, representatives from these different environmental areas or these different factors that we've mentioned already together, um, it could, while you're doing your homework, it could really save you time um, and get you started working with folks right off the top and getting a better understanding of what's a better pulse of what's going on in your community as you go through that and start working on these environmental strategies. Um, determine whether your coalition, uh, just mentioned this also, sorry about that, jumped ahead of myself, um, but what stakeholders need to be there um, to improve uh, your initiatives will succeed. 
Um, you need to look at who's directly affected by the problems, who cares enough to want to solve it, who benefits if it's solved, and what individual groups can help resolve those problems. If you look at those four bullet points just as a head start or a place to begin, um, you could even identify maybe one strategy or a larger strategy that you know is happening in your community and try to get these folks together, invite them to your coalition um, to kind of discuss these environmental strategies and see which way you might want to address that. Um, so another way to kind of see what's going on um, with this is, you know, using the different data that's uh, available to you, um, whether it be the KCTC data or other data you have in your community. Um, but that may be a good starting point for you guys to identify some things that are going on in your communities that you may not even be aware of. So um, just a couple things to work, look, think about while you're working through your community or your environmental strategies um, and your different public policies and things in your community. So um, I'm going to jump over and hand it over to Deanne. Um, she's going to start with communication and education. Um, and then I believe uh, Deanne and Chad will wrap it up and we'll get you done. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, so as Mike and, and um, Heather have both talked about a lot of um, environmental strategies as far as the, the policies and the, um, the practices, and Mike touched a lot about, you know, how do you get started in that, you know, assessing your situation, assessing <clears throat> um, your, your community and finding out, you know, how are they accessing the availability of alcohol? alcohol? Where are you, they using that alcohol? What are your policies and practices that are already in place? <clears throat> Those are really important um, things that your your work group or your coalition members um, need to do in order to, to get you started in deciding um, what are those strategies and how they line up with your, <clears throat> excuse me, how they line up with your risk factor that you've already um, identified on your logic model to make sure that they are a, a good fit for, um, for your strategic plan in your community. Um, so in jumping in um, over to communication and education, um, this can be um, an environmental strategy as well, as it could also be used to increase um, the readiness of your community in order to impact them and to um, for strategies that you've chosen to be successful. There are lots of uh, different kinds of communication and um, education. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time for the sake of time on these. Um, if you go to the SAMHSA website, they have a breakdown of more information on um, each one of these different types of um, communication and, and education. <clears throat> but media messages of all kinds influence how the people thinks and behaves. Um, communication strategies can be used to influence community norms um, increase public awareness, attract community support for a variety of prevention issues or changes in a policy that are needed. Um, and it can also, as Heather touched upon a little bit about teaching critical viewing skills, um, helping youth to realize that they're the ones that are being targeted and how they're being targeted um, by media. There's lots of different kinds um, types of campaigns. Um, the campaigns um, that inform and persuade and they motivate behavior and changes in our large, our large audience. And there's a lot of different ways that campaigns use different media sources that we'll um, talk about uh, a little bit more. There's um, TV, radio, internet, uh, newspapers, social media, banners, billboards, movie ads, yard sites, and I'm sure you guys have all used your um, creativity to come up with other ways also to get your message um, through a campaign to the folks that you want to, to see it. Here are some samples of some campaigns. There are a lot of samples or a lot of campaigns that already exist. They've already been developed. Um, so a lot of the, the time, effort, and the funding has been um, taken care of already. And they've also already been tested. Um, so those um, that's really good to do your, your research and, and find possibly some campaigns that, that already exist. Um, some of them target parents, others may target teens or preteens. Um, so as you can see on the slide, the messages are targeting different risk factors as well as different populations. 
So if you look at the top one in the upper left-hand corner in the blue there, you don't have to drink to have fun. Who is that targeting? In youth, in Kansas, seven out of 10 teens don't drink. So this would be targeting directly youth, and you would wanna put this where youth are going to see it. But what if parents, adults, um, other people, other age um, groups saw this? Would it be detrimental? No, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be at all. It would probably also help to remind them. So this would be a good example of where you're really targeting it is targeting teens. So make sure that your first priority is you're putting it where, where teens will see it. But it won't be harmful or detrimental to other audiences if they see it also. Um, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, the Parents Who Host Lose the Most campaign, that was developed um, to target parents specifically. Um, now, this would be a great campaign to use if you have, during your homework time, assessed that where they're accessing alcohol is in their homes, whether it's deliberately or unintentionally, if parents are the ones who are possibly um, hosting those parties or, or they're happening in the homes or, or they're, they're getting their alcohol from parents that think, oh, it's okay, we'll just take away the keys, at least they're home. If that is through your assessment process what you've identified, then this would be a great campaign. But if during your assessment you've identified that they are using fake IDs and there's retail outlets that are um, allowing youth in your area to purchase alcohol, then this would not be a campaign because it wouldn't line up with, um, with your risk factors and your assessment that you've identified. <clears throat> so be strategic when choosing a campaign and the messages. Make sure that they align that you align them with your uh, risk factor that's identified in your logic model. You, they line up with the target audience that you want to hear that message, and it is appropriate to the outcomes that you are um, that you're wanting and looking for. Ask yourself, what is my purpose? Um, am I raising awareness about a problem? Do I need to raise the heat um, but keep the hope alive? Um, we don't want to add to the problem, but we want to um, to raise that awareness. Um, are you providing educational awareness? Are you trying to change perceptions? Are you increasing the factual norm um, instead of the, the community acceptable norm? So make sure and keep in mind, what is your purpose when you're choosing um, and using these campaigns and these messages to make sure that they are um, targeting the outcomes, like I said, that you are wanting to target? Because it's really easy to get caught up in, oh, that's a great message, and yes, it is a great message, but is that the message that you're really needing to, to target your risk factor? So just be um, cautious of that and aware of that. <clears throat> so direct the message to the right people at the right time and in the right place. Um, on the Talk It Matters example, and um, the target for this message is parents. Um, I jumped ahead of myself, sorry, <laughs> I skipped one. Um, all right, so the, the message I was talking about was the, the it matters here, don't kid yourself. That is um, an example that's targeting parents. Um, it says 10% of sixth graders say they have tried alcohol. By eighth grade, the number jumps nearly 40%. So the message you're trying to get is to parents that this is a prime time where um, their youth those ages are vulnerable, and so be aware, have the talk about um, how dangerous it is. But um, if this message was put on a banner and put in a, um, a middle school auditorium, that would not be the appropriate place for it because you don't want to encourage um, the uh, middle school youth, oh, I'm supposed to be trying alcohol now. I think that's something that I haven't done yet. I better do it. So we need to be careful of making sure that um, the message that we choose are getting to the target audience you want, and if it could be detrimental to um, a different target audience being exposed to it. So this might not be a good um, potential for a banner or posters that are put up, but maybe more so a, a flyer that is given directly to, in the hands of parents, um, that is a mailer um, that is sent to parents. Um, the parents who host lose the most example, you wouldn't want to use that, um, like you said, like you've identified the retail outlets. You would want to make sure and use that um, and directing towards parents if that's your intention. So ask yourself, who is your target audience? Um, 
and who also who else is going to hear and see the message and is um, what kind of an impact is it going to be on others um, one example that I was shared um, in a training many years ago was the Montana meth campaign some of you may have seen it it was very graphic it was very um, um, had a lot of, of good impacts for what they wanted and the target that they were targeting but it also sent a message to um, to um, everybody else that Montana has a huge meth problem so it had an impact impact on economic development on new businesses that maybe would move into the state people that wanted to move there people that would even vacation there that questioned um, the fact that oh Montana has this huge meth problem so they had some um, counterproductivity in other areas so you, it's important to ask yourself um, who was going to all who else going to see this this message not just the target audience but who else might be impacted by it making sure that um, that it's um, not detrimental always keep in mind when you're um, thinking about your your messages is it age appropriate gender appropriate are you being inclusive with um, the the culture um, is it easy for them to read um, and the media habits um, for the age if you are targeting um, parents and parents don't use Twitter then don't use Twitter if you're targeting youth and they don't read the newspaper then don't expect the newspaper to um, to be used to get their the message to them so make sure you you consider the habits of their audience that you're using and um, is it sustainable can you continue this message on um, so you want to make sure that you are using um, opportunities that are going to be some free earned um, media opportunities and where it might be institutionalized maybe you have um, advertisements that are going to be long lasting on like banners and the school and businesses might own um, the media that you're using so think about sustainability when you're also planning um, your media campaigns and also keep in mind um, diversity variety is um, is really key because even excellent messages are subject to wear out with heavy repetition um, so mix it up and um, make sure that you keep their attention and you and, and don't forget social media um, social media is here whether we like it or not and it's here to stay um, so if you're not familiar with using any of the social media outlets that are um, needed for your coalition and your target areas, um, this is a great way to get more people involved and to give the work back to your coalition members. Find coalition members, community members that um, they want purpose, they want a reason why to be involved. This might be a key place that um, you identify that, that this is their um, buy-in, this is their purpose to have um, to have the social media outlets be governed by, by them and, and using them to put those messages out um, to the specific audience that you identify. As you can see on the slide there, um, you can look at the, the number of uses. So Facebook is um, shouldn't be overlooked, um, but you also, um, need to decide and to do a little dig a little deeper and do some research to find out if this is true in your um, specific community in your area to find out what are those media uses and and they could change they could have changed since this research was given out um, so check into it further when you decide to what mediums you're going to use um, there's the traditional and they shouldn't be overlooked um, print some people still definitely use the print the radio TV um, outdoor ads but be strategic in your planning Make, um, as I said before mix it up don't use just one um, and really keep in mind um, the bottom on your screen there people remember 10% of what they hear 20% of what they read and 80% of what they see or do so the more you can get your um, your campaigns or your, your media messages whatever it is the purpose you're using it for the more you can get people involved in it and um, they can see it and not just hear it or read it um, the more they're going to remember it it's going to have a bigger impact also as I mentioned before earned media use make your campaigns bigger than they are use every chance to have a news article um, in your on the slide the picture on the right 
um, was a banner that was presented, it was going to be put up in the schools, but we made a bigger deal out of it. We made it, we presented it to all of the schools at a school board meeting. So these are all our uh, superintendents meetings. So these are all the superintendents of the schools in one county. Um, we presented them with the um, with the banner, so we made a big deal out of it. The media came and took a picture. They wrote an article about it. So it got um, exposure to the coalition, the purpose of our coalition, and um, the another picture of the It Matters campaign and the message that was sent forth. Also was put on social media, um, and those were all free um, free ways to to get out the message again. So every chance you get, do follow up, make it bigger than it is instead of just your um, your one meaning in it. The the one on the, the left was a sticker shock campaign follow-up. Um, you're probably all familiar with the sticker shock and the It Matters campaign had stickers that they put on the alcohol at um, retail stores reminding um, adults not to provide alcohol to minors. And then um, the youth group made these little um, copies of um, these little handouts that were thank you for your commitment not to provide alcohol to minors. They put a men on it and um, put it on the counter of all the retail stores for them to hand out to all of their customers. Um, so this was an, a very inexpensive way to follow up and um, make more of just the It Matters campaign or the um, sticker shot campaign itself. So the three basic concepts to keep in mind um, when you're looking at media planning process, the reach, the quantity, and the frequency. How do you know what you're going, um, how, you, how do you know when enough is enough? We're going to talk a little bit about that. The reach is that how many? To properly determine reach, you need to define who your target audience is first. The highest reach you can typically achieve is 99%. Um, with any media plan, you're going to reach the most accessible people first, people who are pulled into the internet constantly or always watching TV or always listen to the radio, always read the newspaper. Um, as you start to reach more and more people, the harder it becomes and the more it costs. Using multiple mediums um, will be the very best way to build that, that reach. Reach majors, um, measures the accumulation of people over time because reach is always defined for a certain period of time. The number of people exposed to the media vehicles in the media plan increases over time. For example, um, reach may grow from 20% in the first week to 60% by the fourth week. Um, the pattern of audience accumulation varies depending on the media vehicles and the media plan. Um, so reach doesn't double the count, but people exposed multiple times if the media plan involves repeats ads in one um, category and adds to the multiple media categories. So media planners use reach because it represents the total number of people exposed to the marketing communication. And um, you've probably heard um, Dola teach on that and helping to know how to enter those um, in the checkbox so that you get that, um, that reach count for your evaluation purposes. Um, as you can see on the screen, the highest reach, like I said, is 99%. A moderate reach is 70 to 75%, and the lowest reach that you want is 50 to 60%. So you really need to um, have that goal of at least 50% reach in order to get the outcomes that you want. How much is too much and how much is too little? Um, that's... Um, a, a great question, and um, this is just a guideline because we don't know all the answers, but too few exposure or impressions on your message won't break through and get you the results and could result in a wasted budget and time. Too many impressions, and you have not only wasted your budget, but you may also have succeeded in annoying the very target audience that you're trying to persuade. So how much and how often should you expose people to your message? According to this chart, a message would be most effective when exposed to an audience from 5 to 11 times. Um, high levels of frequency can be effectively achieved through advertising in a smaller number of media vehicles to increase audience duplication within these media vehicles. For example, a commercial that runs three times during a 30-minute television program will result in higher message repetition than the same commercial that runs once in three different programs. Um, there's a point at which exposure or frequency of a message is too much and even detrimental. 
substantial um, quantity is necessary for effective campaigns, but not too much. Um, persistence over time is important because each year there are newcomers um, to your viewing audience who are moving in um, and those that are new that could be at risk that weren't before. So um, persistency over a long period of time is important. Um, One-shot interventions will have limited lasting impact. Campaigns need to be sustained, repeated, and updated on an ongoing basis. Um, media function are like a shotgun rather than a rifle, spraying out tiny pellets across a broad audience, which actually may be functional for hitting the moving targets. Um, prominent placement of messages in conspic conspicuous positions with um, media sources serve to enhance both exposure levels and perceived significance. So to maximize quantity, pursue monetary resources from um, different people in your, in your community, different resources, um, look for those free public service time and space and um, earned media to make it more than it is. <clears throat> and don't forget to plan to evaluate your campaign. Um, we have with our, our grants and the, the KDAD's grants, um, it's set up for you in quarterly reports, community checkbox, um, to make sure and report, and that's part of your evaluation of your campaign messages. Um, evaluation as indicated um, on your action plans, make sure that the action plans that you have for it and the steps are being taken and they're being documented that, um, in your reports. And then don't forget to celebrate. Celebrate um, the success and the outcomes that you have and, and celebrate your, um, your campaigns. Okay, we're gonna kind of jump here. We, we talked about um, policies and um, policies and education awareness campaigns. Um, both can be um, environmental strategies, but enforcement and, and with, or um, like Mike said, enforcement policies without enforcement um, are not gonna be effective. So enforcement and policies are closely connected, but it's important to remember that policies are unlikely to be successful without enforcement. So effective enforcement requires um, visibility. You can use your educational awareness campaigns to help to um, impact your enforcement and your, your policies. Um, people need to see that substance use prevention in the community is priority and that the prevention of it is priority and that violating these um, laws and regulations will have consequences. So a sticker shock campaign is um, a good example of how to make um, enforcement visible in your community as we stated here. Enforcement strategies may include surveillance, penalties, fines, detention, um, community policing, and um, incentives. Um, so surveillance um, such as law enforcement walking through, um, doing, having cameras, um, when law enforcement are visible when they do the sticker shot campaign, that's showing um, that visibility and changing that norm and um, getting that visibility of the policies not uh, are going to be enforced and they're not going to be um, allowed for um, to get away with it. Penalties and fines, um, we, um, we understand those. There are um, consequences for people that, that break the, um, that don't abide by the, the policies. Um, community policing, encouraging communities um, to, to get involved. Um, another way to, to, um, to do this is the 1-800-MUST-BE-21 um, campaign, using that to help encourage uh, people in communities to report underage drinking parties. Um, and then incentives, and Mike mentioned incentives, another way for um, visibility of education and incentives to be um, used for enforcement, an idea was shared how a uh, coalition could have cards that are um, just a cards, good job card, or even could come um, be included with an incentive such as um, a gift card or maybe a coupon to uh, a business that you partnered with for a 20% a off or a free ice cream cone or something. So if your coalition had those incentive cards and they went into an establishment and they saw that somebody was carding um, somebody or not allowing a minor to um, 
to access alcohol, that they could give an incentive, and that would be a visible way to encourage that, um, that positive norm and that change in your community. And we talked a little bit about this already, policies, of course, a lot about it. Um, there's informal and there's formal policies. And sometimes you'll hear these con um, named as big P's and little P's. Um, big P's being the, the formal and little P's being the informal. <clears throat> sometimes policy change success is not just in the policy itself, though, which I think might um, mention briefly, but making adjustments to already existing policies as identified in, um, in your, during your assessment time. Maybe the consequences are not appropriate, administered, or enforced consistently. Um, and this is where I have an example of a community that I worked with that they, yes, they had the social um, host law. Um, they had it in Kansas. It was a part of um, a community law, but it was not being enforced. But it was not being enforced because they didn't feel like um, the community was aware of it. So we did the Parents Who Host Lose the Most campaign for a couple of years, really got that visibility out there, that education awareness out there. And then um, after that had been implemented for a couple of years, the county attorney and law enforcement said, okay, they've been warned, they know, so now we're going to begin enforcing it. And through media and communi um, the communication and education piece, um, they, we were able to say, this is going to be in, enforced and here is going to be the consequences. And then they were followed through. Um, so sometimes it takes digging deeper and finding out what is really going on in your community and what adjustments um, might need to be made that can make a big difference. So don't overlook um, <clears throat> the, the small P's um, because even those changes can make a, a huge difference. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. CADCA is um, Communities Anti-Drug Coalitions of America that most of you are probably familiar with, and they do a lot of extensive training to help communities um, maintain safe and healthy and drug-free <coughs> communities. <coughs> excuse me, through coalition work. And in their training materials, they teach on these seven strategies for community change. Um, the top three: provide information, build skills, provide social support. Are more individually focused but oftentimes are very much need to be a part of your strategic plan because they need to take place in order for the environmental focused um, changes to, um, to be successful. So <clears throat> there's also a lot more information about these and you can ask your community support specialist, go on the CADCA website, <clears throat> excuse me, or the SAMHSA website and um, <clears throat> a lot of these we have, um, we've already have touched on, but if you want more information, um, <clears throat> Ketka is a great place to go for that. <clears throat> this should all be very familiar with you, with, <clears throat> with all of you. These are your action plans and I just wanted to show it to make sure that just like any other strategy that you're implementing, even if it doesn't take a lot of funding, which environmental strategies, it's one of the, the good things about them is that they don't take a lot of funding like a program um, individual strategy might, but you need to make an action plan um, for all of your strategies that are in your logic model. So as all the rest of them, the um, environmental strategies will have an action plan and the arrow pointing down to the steps is being as specific as possible when you're filling out your action plan for your environmental strategy on what steps need to be taken in order to accomplish and implement your strategy. And this can be a bit of a challenge because sometimes um, you just don't know what step two or three or four is going to be. But do this to the best of your ability on um, what you know needs to take place. Um, this is a living document, so you can add to it and make changes as you go. Um, and just want to remind you not to forget to add evaluation steps um, to, to your action steps as you develop these action plans. Um, I also... I'm going to um, just let you know that there is a how-to step tool um, that we were going to have as handouts, and um, GoToMeeting doesn't allow us to have them here for you to download. So we will give them to the community support specialist. We'll be we'll have them, um, and also they are on the workstation. Um, and so Chad's made them available, and he can maybe speak more to that on where to find that um, handout that does have some some steps that are. Um, um, recommended as far as when you make policy and um, 
different um, rules and laws and, and enforcement changes that might be of help to you. So uh, that is all that I have. Um, so if there's no questions or remarks, and if there is, you can um, put them in the chat. You can contact us individually later, later and also contact your community support specialist for um, any help, as well as any of us on the, um, on the KPC team, support team for you. Feel free to, to reach out, and, um, and we'll be there to help you in whatever way we can. Thank you, everybody, so much for, um, for listening, and I'm going to turn it over to Chad. Thanks, Deanne. Um, this is Chad, and let's go ahead and go to the next slide um, for the evaluation survey. Okay, so you you may be able to copy and paste the link from here. If you can't, I'm going to try real quickly um, to copy and paste the link into the chat so that you can use that for the evaluation survey. Let's see if I can get this there. That's okay. Okay, so the link should be there. I may have done it twice, I think. No, I just did it once. So the link is in the chat as well. Um, for the evaluation survey, please do complete that, offer your thoughts, help us do better, help us um, learn from you all what, what is helpful about this webinar and, and other webinars like this. Um, Deanne, go ahead and advance it to the next slide. The next slide includes the reference list, I believe, um, yeah. for the materials, for the sources that were used for the content in this, in this webinar, so you can use um, Though that list to get more information, um, especially the a lot of it comes from CADCA and SAMHSA. Um, many of the slides were adapted from the Youth Leadership Institute, and then also some information was shared from the Center on Alcohol Marketing and Youth, or the the CAMI.org site there. Um, Deanne, go ahead and advance it to the next slide, and this is our contact us slide. Um, there ought to be some familiar names and email addresses there. And I hope that you know who to get a hold of if you have any questions or would like more information about any of this covered today in the webinar. We will be having a follow-up message um, with the webinar, and it will link to um, a few different resources. It will have the handout that Deanne mentioned. It will have the slide deck um, in the PowerPoint presentation. It will also have the evaluation survey link. And then there'll be a, a couple of reminders for some upcoming events for the KPC. And, and one of them is um, the, the first KPC Prevention Advocacy Day, which will be on Kansas Day, January 29 in Topeka. If you haven't had a chance to register for that, please do and, and schedule with your law make, lawmaker, your community uh, assigned legislator for a, a personal meeting with them in the afternoon and the morning we'll be preparing for that conversation and we, we have a, a training presentation that we're going to offer and then some, um, some more support training and technical assistance um, that morning actually to help you, help you do some last minute preparing for the, the meeting with your legislator that's scheduled in later in the afternoon by you. Um, our, the next time that we all get together is February 14 for another webinar on cultural competence and sustainability. And we're looking forward to that being a, a new way to present and share some of the information um, and hopefully will help us think about it in some different ways um, and, and make sure that we're, we're highlighting those overarching factors of the strategic prevention framework in all steps of, of our processes. So um, I think that will wrap things up today. Thank you, Heather and Mike and Deanne for presenting. Um, really appreciated the information that you put together and, and shared with us all. And, and thank you all that are attending for your participation and um, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right, everyone. I'll talk to everyone later. All right. Thanks, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.